Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin ve salatu ve selam ala abdillahi ve rasulih nebiyyina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in amma ba'd. So once again we're going to be resuming our weekly Q&A inşallah ta'ala. Uh, this weekly Q&A isn't going to continue uh, indefinitely inşallah ta'ala. The plan is to continue it until the masjid opens again. So we don't know exactly what the situation is going to be with the masjid opening again. But the idea would be, inshallah ta'ala, we probably have a couple more weeks uh, there or thereabouts. So at some point what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch off the responses on the Google form. Um, probably I'm going to do that this week, inshallah, uh, just to disable responses on the form. And that will mean that we can focus the last couple of weeks with answering the questions that we haven't yet answered. Some, sometimes I skip a question because I don't know the answer to it. Sometimes I skip a question because it needs more time than I have. Sometimes I want to come back to it, research more. So there are still many questions that we wanted to answer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to disable responses on the form. We already have over 300 questions, alhamdulillah. And then, inshallah, we'll focus the next couple of weeks or the next maybe two to three weeks, Allah knows best, in answering all of the questions that are outstanding, anything that we haven't answered so far. Now, one other thing that I saw is there, were, uh, there are questions that are coming on repeat. And if you asked your question early on, it's possible that your question was answered, but you weren't watching the live stream when the question was answered. Um, it's difficult, perhaps we need to go through and make like a, a list of the questions that were answered in each video. That might be beneficial because uh, there are questions coming again, like question number 200 and whatever, 40 or something, is the same as a question that I answered, which is question number 25 or something, from the same person, the same wording. So probably what happened was the person didn't, wasn't around to see the answer. So this is something we try to work on. But by the end, inshallah, the hope is that every question that was asked, that it is possible for me to answer, I will try to answer it, inshallah ta'ala. So this next question is ideal, and I'm just going in order as best I can. I deal with sihr, ayn, and jinn issues. First of all, we ask this person, or we ask Allah for this person. We ask Allah Azza to give them complete shifa that leaves behind no sickness. Do you have any advice for such people who have great trouble with brain fog, have very, very hard time having khushu' during the salah and when reciting ruqya too? I fear my ruqya may not be effective because a lack, a lack of concentration. Please answer. So there are two aspects to this. The first is the person who is suffering from jinn issues specifically and the second is generally, and I, and I actually believe that even if a person is suffering from jinn issues here, it's perfectly possible for that person to uh, apply the same answer that we would give to someone who isn't suffering from jinn issues. And the hope was that this would give them a boost, inshallah ta'ala. So the basic concept that we have when the shaitan causes you confusion and causes you to become, you can't concentrate, is the ayah at the end of Surah Al-A'raf. And I don't remember the number of the ayah from the top of my head, but it's one of the last ayat in Surah Al-A'raf on the last page. It's, it's among the final ayat in the Surah. And that is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Indeed, those people who are touched by an affliction from the shaitan. And that affliction, it could be an affliction like the affliction of jinn possession, but it could also be a touch like just making you forget something or making you get suddenly angry, like the shaitan does to all of us. What is the solution? Allah Azza wa Jal said, تَذَكَّرُوا They remember. فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ Then they can see clearly. So what is it that they remember? There are two things. First of all, they remember that it's from the shaitan. So when they get in this brain fog and conf confusion, and they're feeling lost, they remember 
that this is from the shaitan. And that allows them to see clearly because they remember it's not from them. They understand it's not me. This is not me. They understand that. And they understand that if it's from their enemy, the shaitan, inna shaitan alakum aduun fattakhiduhu aduwa, the shaitan is an enemy to you, so take him as an enemy. So when they realize that it's from the shaitan, they realize it's from their enemy. So what do they do? They renew their resolve, they double their efforts, they push it away. They understand that when you're fighting an enemy, you don't win every moment of that fight, usually speaking, you know, not a hundred percent of the time. These days we divide among the people. You have some good times, sometimes where you don't quite get it, but you keep on fighting because it's your enemy. Take him as an enemy. The second thing you remember is you remember Allah. And that's why some of the scholars of tafsir, they said about the words, uh, they remember Allah. And by remembering Allah, this can push the shaitan out of your mind. Now, don't get me wrong. When you're afflicted with jinn issues, it can be hard to do that. But it's the struggle that matters. It's the fighting against it that matters. Allah said, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Have as much taqwa of Allah as you can. Do the best that you can. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, سَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا do the right thing and come as close to it as you can. The Prophet ﷺ said, Istaqimu walan tuhsu. He said, be upright in Islam, but you will not be able to be perfect. You won't do it perfectly. So this is what a person has to do to remember Allah, to remember this is coming from the shaitan, to fight it with everything they can and to remember Every day you have ups and downs. Allah gives. Sometimes the shaitan gets the better of you. And sometimes you overcome that shaitan. But ultimately, this is so that Allah can test. So Allah can test those among you who believe. That Allah can test your iman. So strive against it. Struggle against it. Don't despair. Put your trust in someone who is greater than the shaitan and more powerful than the shaitan. Put your trust in Allah, Jalla fi ula. Put your trust in Allah, you'll be absolutely fine. And I have a video about khushu' in salah, which might be helpful. You could refer to it. It's called Successful Prayer. And it's on the Kalima UAE YouTube channel. It's one of the old videos I did while I was with Kalima Islamic Center in Dubai. So you can go to Kalima UAE on YouTube, K-A-L-E-M-A-H-U-A-E, and you can type in Muhammad Tim successful prayer, and I'm sure the video will come up in that, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah Azza knows best. If an individual's surname is Rahman, must they change it to something else? So the issue of first names and surnames and things like that Often what happens is that the person has a, a full name, but the parent uh, splits the name between the first name and the, uh, and the surname. So, for example, not usually with Abd, it's not usually that the first name is Abd and the second name is Rahman, but maybe some of the more the, the different names like, for example, Habib or Rahman or something like that. And they put Habib as the first name and they put Rahman as the second. When really these two in Arabic, they should be a compound. They should, they should go together like Abdul Rahman. They should be one name that is part of a single name. And with regard to Rahman, Rahman is one of those names that you can't have on its own. It's a name you can't have uh, on its own. And the difficulty with it being a surname is that then somebody addresses you Mr. Rahman and that's not, not appropriate in terms of its meaning. It's not right because it, it has to be, this is a name that has to be a compound name like Abdul Rahman or Amatul Rahman, so on. It has to, has to be a name that, that exists in a, in a compound and it can't exist by itself. 
as for uh, a person wanting to shorten their name so let's say for example we give the example of Habib there's nothing wrong with having the name Habib it's okay you can have the name you can shorten the first part to Habib but you can't shorten the second part to Rahman you can't shorten the second part like that sometimes it's difficult for a person to change their uh, surname I don't know how easy it is for a person um, but it's certainly the difficulty is how do you avoid people addressing you with that second name and not the first um, so the first one we said is fine but like for example if someone had Abd and then Rahman how do you avoid someone referring to you as Mr. Rahman which is not appropriate in terms of the meaning because Rahman is a meaning that's only appropriate for Allah whether it comes with Al or without Al whether it comes as Ar-Rahman or just Rahman on its own it's a meaning that's only appropriate for Allah likewise uh, Samad and some of the other names of Allah there are names that you can take like Rahim there is no issue with that a person can be Rahim you can, have, you can be called Mr. Rahim there is no issue with that but Rahman is unique for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with or without Al so it's, it's down to the person to see for some people it might not be a problem person just simply says you know you can either call me such and such or you can call me my whole name Abdul Rahman but you can't call me Rahman and they might find that's enough it's enough to just tell people others might wish to change it formally depending on how easy that is to do for them and Allah is our general's best what's the ruling on the Islamic Adhan clock is it sufficient to listen to it and not to recite it yourself? The Islamic Adhan clock is an excellent tool for reminding you that the time for the prayer has come. Putting an Adhan app on your phone, having a clock or a watch or an app or whatever that plays the Adhan at the time of the Salat is a nice thing. But it doesn't replace the Adhan. And it's not considered to be an Adhan for the purposes of Islam. So the Adhan is a Sunnah, it's not required, but there is a great reward in giving the Adhan even when you pray by yourself. So especially in these days where most of us or many of us are under COVID-19 restrictions, we can't go very far, we can't go to the masjid in many cases, then I would highly, highly recommend that a person takes to praying the Jama'ah in the house with the people who, are, who they have with them and giving the Adhan even if they're on their own or the person who prays at work in a musalla let them pray in the musalla give the adhan because giving the adhan even if you're by yourself is a, a virtuous a virtuous thing but the adhan clock that doesn't count as an adhan it's just a reminder to remind you that the time for the prayer has come and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best I had already answered this question uh, in uh, to a certain extent it's about Islamic mortgages and I had already answered it last week to the best that I can in this kind of sitting now obviously not every question is is possible to answer in this sort of sitting where it's a QA. and a I would I could only recommend maybe that if you were to go through the principles of Islamic finance course Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan has done with Al Madrasa Al Umariya uh, you could go, I'm sure it's on the AMAU channel, so you could go to uh, youtube.com, you could type in uh, AMAU or Al Madrasa Al Umariya, and you should get the Al Madrasa Al Umariya channel. When you click on that, you can search for finance, and there should be a series of videos called something like Principles of Islamic Finance. Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan and inshallah ta'ala this will be will be of great benefit to explaining some of the fundamental principles I do very much want to take some time to jot down how the process should really work but for that it is going to require more time than we have in a Q&A session and Allah's journal's best can we learn Islamic calligraphy is it permissible to write the words of Allah or the ayat in a beautiful manner or just people's names? 
So there's nothing wrong with learning Islamic calligraphy as a concept. It's a very beautiful thing. And there are many branches of Islamic calligraphy. It's not my expertise, so I don't want to go too much into it. But there is Islamic calligraphy that's very art, very like art. And there is also things like how to write the Mus'haf, how to be able to write the Qur'an and the rules for writing the Qur'an. That's a part of the science of Ulum al-Qur'an, of the sciences of the Qur'an. So uh, there's nothing wrong with learning uh, Islamic calligraphy. But there is one uh, thing we must be aware of, and that is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Don't take the ayat of Allah as a joke or a jest or a game or something light. So we don't come to the Qur'an and use the Qur'an for artwork because the Qur'an is much more serious than that. The Qur'an deals with Jannah and Jahannam. The Qur'an deals with the matters which will decide where your eternal life will be. It's not appropriate to use that for artwork. It's not appropriate to make that art out of it. So bearing in mind, nothing wrong with calligraphy, and many times, uh, this calligraphy can be greatly beneficial. Even, th for example, uh, I started a project on Allah's names and we translated some books and po podcasts and working on some videos for that. And I was hoping to have each name done in artistic calligraphy for the beauty of it. Inna Allah jamilun yuhibbu jamal. Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty um, to accompany the project. But it wouldn't be like artwork, if that makes sense. It wouldn't be something to put on your wall. The purpose of it would be to beautify each chapter of, of the names of Allah by, by having the name written in, in, in beautiful calligraphy to add beauty to the, the context of what's already there. But as for uh, a person sort of decorating their wall with the Qur'an or something like that, then I don't think this is appropriate to do because it comes under, or we fear that it comes under the statement of Allah Don't take the ayat of Allah as something light. Don't take it as a jest. Don't take it as a joke. Don't take it as artwork, as a bit of play, a bit of fun. The ayat of Allah are very, very serious indeed. So nothing wrong with writing people's names. Nothing wrong with writing something beneficial. And... Nothing wrong with using calligraphy, calligraphy to beautify something. You know, for example, you have written, I don't know, you, you might have written a piece, a document, a, a reminder about something, and you might make the first word in calligraphy or something. There is, is inshallah, no harm in this. Or decorating the book cover with calligraphy, the name of the book, and so on. These are all permissible things, so... I don't see there to be any problem in learning calligraphy, but we don't want people to use, and it, it doesn't have to be calligraphy that does this, it could be without, but we don't want people to see the ayat of Allah as being artistic, um, that, that it's, it's a matter of art, but really it's a matter of seriousness. But there's no harm in beautifying uh, these things, the, the names of Allah and so on. Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty and Allah Azawajal knows best. If the follower of the Qadiyani religion verbally testifies La ilaha illallah and outwardly pretends to be a Muslim, is it permissible to make takfir upon them? So just to explain this question a little bit, because the question might be difficult for everybody to understand. The issue of takfir is the idea of declaring someone else to be a non-Muslim. If we were talking in terms of other religions, they might call it excommunication. But in Islam, it's something bigger than that. It's more than that. Excommunication is this idea that you are you know, kicked out of the religion. Um, in Islam, it's much bigger than that. It's to declare someone to be a non-Muslim, to make a declaration that you are a non-Muslim. And before we talk about the question, let's just talk about a few really important principles. The first thing is that takfir is a serious issue. It's a big deal to declare another person to be a non-Muslim in contrary to their own statement. We're not talking about a Christian says, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. You say, okay, that's easy. They're a Christian. But 
for someone to come and say, I'm a Muslim, and for you to say to them, no, you are not, you are a disbeliever, that is a serious thing to do. And it should be, broadly speaking, left to people of knowledge, the people of knowledge, broadly speaking. And it shouldn't be, Muslims shouldn't be overly keen to, to, to get involved in those matters because of how serious it is. However, we, don't, we can't close the door completely because this idea of the existence of takfir, the existence of a process by which a person can be declared that they are no longer fulfilling the conditions of Islam, they're no longer a Muslim, is an important part of safeguarding Islam, in all honesty. And those people who declare it to be wrong across the board, that's also wrong because it's there to protect Islam. Otherwise, it would be possible, for example, for the munafiq, the hypocrite, that is someone who deliberately enters Islam with the purpose of wrecking it from the inside. That's what they did in Medina, right? You know the history of the hypocrites in Medina, what they did, the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. They entered into Islam completely, deliberately faked being Muslims in order to destroy Islam from the inside. So they would, for example, say that, yes, I'm a Muslim. And then two days later, they would make a statement that I'm not a Muslim anymore. And they would do so in order to, to sow doubt in the hearts of people. that Oh, he must have found something in this religion that's terrible or whatever. And these were a group of people that were well known, or at least many of them were well known and the plots and plans they did. So if we didn't have a process of excluding people, this would be able to repeat itself within the Muslim community again and again and again. And there would be potential also for people to commit acts of disbelief and to call other people to that and bring people to it and have other people follow them and there to be no um, way that we could deal with that. So, for example, you have a person stands up and says that he is God incarnate or that he is a new prophet, a new prophet, or that he is a, an incarnation of God. And he calls the people to that. If you didn't have the process of takfir in Islam, you would never be able to handle that situation because you have no means to kick that person out of the religion. You have no means to do it. And this is also appropriate when you talk about all the things that are done in the name of Islam. And Islam's name would never, it would never survive if there wasn't a way by which you can disassociate and cut someone off from Islam when they no longer fulfill what is needed to be a Muslim. So, in that sense, it's important, but it's also dangerous because if I get it wrong, I'm making the ultimate pronouncement upon a person. I'm pronouncing them to be a disbeliever. I'm, I'm completely excluding them from the religion of Islam. The, the repercussions of that are so severe and serious in this world and the hereafter. In this world, the judicial punishment for leaving Islam is extremely severe. On top of that, that is in countries where that is enforced. On top of that, you have the even in a country where a person is not living in, under any Islamic rules and is not subject to any penalty, the danger of their family breaking up from them, leaving them, uh, potentially, you know, losing their children, their family, the community completely cutting them off. This is a really big thing. So it's really important that we tread very carefully with takfir. We understand that it's an important part of safeguarding Islam because it's the ultimate threat that nobody can just say what they want. Nobody can just come up and do something in the name of Islam and then think that we will not respond to that, especially when it comes to matters of belief and disbelief. But even broadly speaking, when it comes to matters of all matters that go against Islam and someone does something in the name of Islam, we need to have measures that we can take to ostracize that person, to cut them off 
and to stop Islam from being damaged by what they do. So it's an important part of that, a tabdi' declaring someone to be an innovator, takfir, declaring someone to be a disbeliever, declaring someone to be an innovator is of a, a lesser level usually, unless the innovation is one which encompasses this belief. But it's also important to say this person isn't representing the pure Islam that they should be. Otherwise, what response would we have to things like terrorism and uh, extremism, religious extremism? How would we respond to that as a Muslim community? As a, a, in terms of theologically, I'm not talking about in terms of law enforcement, in terms of theologically, how would we respond to that? How do we tell people this is not from Islam if we don't have in Islam a takfir or tabdi' if we don't have ways of kicking somebody out of the religion or declaring that person to be completely opposed to the pure religion of Islam. So these are tools, but these are tools, they have to be, they're like a sword. They have to be wielded in the hand of someone who knows what they're doing. Otherwise, that person's a danger to themselves and to other people. And that's why we see that within the groups of who are religious extremists uh, and those groups that are known for exceeding the boundaries of what Islam has allowed, there are a subset of them that their extremism is extremism in takfir. So they declare many, many people to be non-believers to the point that Perhaps some of them would even get to the point where he says there is no Muslim left on the earth except you and me. Because he doesn't know how to wield that sword properly. So what happens is he goes out and tries to defend Islam and he sees that this person is doing something wrong. And he says, you know, that man is doing something wrong. He's a kafir. He's a disbeliever. And that man's doing something wrong. He's a kafir too. And that man's... And he failed to understand the limits and the, how we reconcile because all of us do things that are wrong. Sometimes we do things that are incredibly wrong and not, that doesn't necessarily necessitate a person to be a disbeliever as such and that requires a lot of knowledge. The second issue is that there is a difference between making a ruling upon a group or upon a belief system versus making a ruling upon an individual person. And this is what we call takfir al-mu'ayyan, making a pronouncement of disbelief upon a specific individual. So it's, it's easier for me to make a pronouncement of disbelief upon a particular theology, right? So we talked here about the Qadiyaniyya. In the Qadiyaniyya, without a shadow of a doubt, the beliefs that are held by that group exclude them from being a part of Islam. There is no doubt about that. And I mean that from a theological sense. We're talking about, you know, purely from a theological sense. If you study the beliefs of that group and what they propagate and what they believe in, those beliefs are not compatible with Islam at all. They're not, it's not like they're semi-compatible. We can, you know, they're Muslims but not good Muslims or Muslims but they are completely and fundamentally incompatible with Islam. And the person who holds them is not a Muslim. That is a pronouncement upon a particular theology or a particular set of beliefs or a particular group of people. But then to go down to an individual, now we have Muhammad. He says, my name is Muhammad. I believe those things. There's there are further checks and balances needed before we can go and make that pronouncement upon Muhammad himself. Why? Because there are additional things that needed to be checked. For example, does he understand what he believes? And this is from the Rahmah of Islam. Someone comes and says, I believe I am a prophet. Before we cut that person down and you know, exclude them from Islam in every sense of the word, we first have to run through some basic checks. Does this person even seem? Do they even understand what they're saying? Do they even have any understanding? Do they understand what Islam is? You know, people come out and say statements that, wallahi, if they said them in the time of 
maybe a hundred years ago, the people would have been unanimous in, in expelling them from Islam. And today we have to say to them, do you even understand what Islam is? Do you even understand what you have said? Do you understand the severity of the words that you have said? Do you understand why that's wrong? Is the person sane? Are they being compelled or forced under a threat of, of uh, punishment or someone is threatening them uh, in a way that is compelling them to say something? This person here who says someone who he's, he's Qadiani and he says La ilaha illallah and says I'm a Muslim. So we have to look at this person because there's one of two situations. They either believe what the Qadiani believe or they don't. But it's difficult for me to, to make this blanket statement upon that particular individual at that time because I don't know the reality of that person. Is the person inclined to Islam so that they have said that they have said that, uh, that they have completely you know, gone back on their beliefs and they've come towards Islam. So whoever professes Islam, we accept it from them. Yeah? Like we accept it from them. We don't, we don't look into the hearts of the person and it's well known the, uh, the hadith um, regarding the Sahabi who killed a person after he said, La ilaha illallah. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Did you kill aqatalta nafsan? After it said, La ilaha illallah. After that person said, La ilaha illallah. Did you kill that person? Because it was a battle. They were fighting. The soldiers were fighting each other. And just as the, the soldier raised the sword against his opponent, his opponent said, I, I've become Muslim. La ilaha illallah. I'm a Muslim. So by the law of Islam, he has to stop fighting him. Because he's not allowed to continue. The, the, the enemies are fighting. One enemy, the, 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 the polytheist army and the Muslim army says, no, I've come to your side. I'm on your side now. So he saw that from this person, that this person was only saying these words to save themselves. They're only saying it to save themselves. He has no interest in Islam. And no, he just wanted to, he saw that the sword was on his head and then he just said, okay, may as well, I'm with you. I quit my army, I'm going to join your army now. So when the Sahabi saw this, he killed the man. The Prophet ﷺ came to him and he said, Did you kill a person after he said, La ilaha illallah? He said, oh, Messenger of Allah, he only did it to save himself. He didn't have any sincerity in what he said. He said, Have you, have you killed a person after he said, La ilaha illallah? So the point is that when a person makes a genuine statement, like we don't have to cut the person's heart open to look inside to see, is this person really serious or not? Rather, if the person seems to be genuine, we accept it from them. Um, however, in this case, you have someone who this particular group of people regularly pose as Muslims. And they regularly conceal their beliefs. So, for example, we know that the belief of the Qadiyaniya is to believe in a Prophet who came after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we know this belief is fundamentally incompatible with Islam and it takes a person outside of the religion of Islam. So the person comes and says, that's not what I believe. I don't believe that Ghulam Mirza Qadiyani was a Prophet. I believe that he was a guide. I believe that he was a... And they change the words but the reality is the beliefs don't change it's just concealing the belief and concealing belief is something which is exists within many uh, splinter groups from islam that they conceal what they really believe they don't tell people what they really really believe in their heart but instead they use sort of words to cover it up and i've seen such things i've seen it with my own eyes before i you know i've sat op opposite someone who was a shi'i and he, they came for iftar and the person sat down and we sat, we ate the iftar in the masjid and the person said, you know, he's, uh, you know I'm, I'm Shi'i um, and I said, you know, from the Shia and I said to him, okay, you know and he said, but you know, I want you to know that I love Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and you know, you and me, we're not so different and our beliefs are very similar and you should not misunderstand me or think that I ha harbor evil beliefs towards the companions. I love all of the companions. It's just that you and me see things a little differently. Wallah, look at that. Jameel, huh? Really beautiful. 
Five minutes later, he was cursing Abu Bakr, cursing Umar, cursing the Sahaba. All ki every kind of evil came from his mouth. Now, I'm not saying that's representative of everybody. I'm not saying it's even representative of all of the Shia. I'm just saying that I witnessed this with my own eyes. I was sat in front of this person while he swore to me, Aqsama billahi jahta. Yani he swore jahta iman. He swore the so strongest of oaths that you and me, you know, you just don't feel like this. We just see things a little different. You and me, when you know, please don't ever think that I think something bad of Sahaba. Me and you, we just, you know, we a little bit different. I see something a little bit from my side, you see from your side, but we can all be friends. We can all get, I thought, wow, this is great, you know, like it's lovely. But the reality is, you just poke the, you know, stick a couple of times and everything comes up. So I just, you know, asked a couple of simple questions to find out if this person is real, genuine. You know, I said, okay, is that true? So I asked a couple of things. I don't remember what I asked right now. And it all came out. The person started to swear, to curse, to say evil things about us, to say evil. And I, I understood that what, whatever you might say, that particular individual, I'm not talking about everybody, but that particular person was only concealing what they held in their heart. It would have been better for them to come and say, I hate you and I hate everything you believe in. I hate your perspective on Islam and I hate the Sahaba. And I, and I, you know, we, we would have at least known where we stood. But to come and then dress that up and say, oh, you and me, you know, we just, we're the same. There's just a little difference between us. Why you make it? And then two minutes later, the person brought out all of the evil that was within them. It just came out. So this person could be like that. Could be a person who says, yeah, it's true. Uh, they call themselves Ahmadi uh, rather than the word Qadiani. Say that it's true. The person says Ahmadi. But when you... You know, he says, but you know, I believe la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. I don't believe in any prophet after the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I, you know, I perform the salah and I give the zakah and so on. And, you know, I'm regular Muslim just like you. But then sometimes when you, you know, you prod a little bit, the real stuff comes out. Uh, and sadly, there are people like that because I, I really find that to be a really horrible way to live your life, to be honest. I think in all honesty, you know, be open with people what you believe, tell people what you believe and let them judge you based on what you believe. But what does it say about a person's belief? And I know they would argue that's because of persecution and, you know, the, the Muslims persecute them and so on. But we're not talking about that situation. We're talking about the UK right here. No one's persecuting anybody. You know, no one's, no one's getting persecuted for their religious beliefs. Why don't you have the guts to say what you really believe? Why is it that you have to conceal it and, and tell people this thing that, you know, you and me, we're the same. I believe in the same prophet you believe in. And then you go home and believe in a different prophet. I mean, what can, what can I do with that? So this is a difficult question. I rather talk about principles of takfir. There's no doubt that the Qadianiyah, the Ahmadis, whatever you want to call them, are not Muslims. They have not fulfilled the minimum conditions to remain within the religion of Islam from a theological standpoint. They haven't fulfilled those conditions. They have not fulfilled La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, the first pillar of Islam, that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad وسلم, is the last and final messenger of Allah. وسلم. They haven't fulfilled that. That's not, they have not fulfilled that condition. And so they can't become a Muslim and they can't be a Muslim until they uh, fulfill that. But if a person comes to you and says to you, that's what I believe, I'm, I'm a Muslim, I believe there's no God except Allah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, I perform the prayer, the salah and so on. We accept from the people what they put before us, but be careful of a people who conceal what they really believe. And don't be fooled by the first time that a person smiles at you and says, you know, you and me, we're on the same side and, you know, it's just a small difference and we're misunderstood. And then, you know, you just, ask them a couple of questions and the person brings out what they really believe in their heart. And that's sad that people have to live their life like that. You know, I think it's one thing I, I really believe in is that, is as much as possible trying to be open with people. Like Alhamdulillah, I do my very best not to hide people. I, I don't give different lessons. Like I'm not one of those people who gives a private class and a public class. And in the private class, I tell people what I really believe 
and in the public class I, I give people something else I try to what you see from me that's how, that's me yeah, to the best of my ability I mean, sometimes we we can't yeah, I mean, declare ourselves to be free of errors don't declare yourself to be pure Allah knows better who fears him so I'm not going to say that you know perfect but try your best like, you tell people what you really believe and it's sad to see these different groups and sects that have an affiliation to Islam they're not Muslim but they have that connection to Islam or claim Islam for themselves but they're not willing to share with people what they really believe because they know that what the people's reaction to it would be it's nothing to do with persecution in some countries it might be but it's nothing to do with persecution it's to do with the fact that if you told people what you really believed they would have ran from you like a person runs from a lion that's 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 why it is honestly that's the same with the shia with the rafida the ithnay ashariya the twelvers and all of these other groups that if you told the people what you really believed you would see them run like you run from a lion and that's sad that a person conceals their belief like that Wallahu musta'an how do we respond to people it's a beautiful question how do we respond to people who say why do you believe in Allah it's a beautiful question may Allah bless the brother who asked this question why do you believe in Allah and that really shows you that a person is really thinking because often in a dawah situation to begin with before you have knowledge of Islam or before you gain knowledge of Islam you might understand the truth of it internally like me personally like yeah I, I get it in my mind Islam is true and I understand why I worship Allah but the question is can you express to someone else why you do it can you express to somebody why it is that you worship Allah? And here I'm going to give you a little bit of advice. And, and again, if you would like to refer to a more detailed course, there is a course on the Kalima UAE YouTube channel, K-A-L-E-M-A-H-U-A-E, and the topic is called the Fiqh of Da'wah. The Fiqh of Da'wah. It's, an, it's a nice topic, inshallah. I like to give a bit more detail. But one of the most beautiful things you can do is why don't you respond with the Qur'an rather than responding with your own attempt to express why you worship Allah So I'm trying to find the words, why do I worship Allah Someone might say, well I haven't memorized the Qur'an but you don't have to Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in That's enough and I'm sure that the person who asked this question memorized those four ayat. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Maliki Yomidin, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. This, if you present it correctly, can answer the person's question. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. In fact, if you want to stop there, it's enough for you. The rest is extra. If you just want to stop with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, that is your answer. I praise Allah and praising Allah is a kind of worship. And I believe that Allah is deserving of that praise. He doesn't need it because he's a samad. Qul hu Allahu ahad, Allahu samad. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need it. A samad is the one who doesn't need anyone. He doesn't need it. But everyone needs him. But he deserves it. Alhamdulillah. All praise is deserving to be given to Allah. Why? Why is it deserving? Because Allah is Rabbul Alameen. Allah is the Lord of all of the worlds. The world of the men. The worlds of the animal, the animal kingdom. The world of the angels. The world of the jinn the worlds that we know and the worlds that we don't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of all of them. And if we talk about what the Lord is and what the Lord does, 
the sustainer, the controller, the creator, the provider. All of those things come within the, the one who everything that happens in this universe happens by his creation and his command, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Add to that Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, the bestower of mercy. Maliki Yawmiddin, the true owner of the day of recompense. Ultimately, that's why we worship Allah. Because of his names and his attributes and his actions. Because the names and the attributes and the actions of Allah make him deserving of worship. And it's really interesting when you think about slavery. Slavery to a human being is nothing praiseworthy. Did anyone ever get praised for being enslaved by another human being? Slavery is something that it's a low status to be a slave, to be enslaved. It's, a, it's the lowest level of society, right? You know, if you talk about the social you know, levels, the lowest you could imagine in any society in the history is for a person to be enslaved and yet the greatest status a person can ever achieve and the highest of all of the statuses is to be a slave to Allah and that's because slavery to Allah is deserving as for slavery to a human being no human being has that right of of uh, what's the word that that you that you are that they're necessarily better than you in that regard but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who deserves for you to be a slave of Allah, to be a servant of Allah. He deserves it because he is Rabbul Alameen and that encompasses all of his names and attributes and actions because of his mercy, because of the fact that we will be gathered to him on the day of judgment and we will have to answer for what we do and no one will be able to help us on that day except Allah. Azza wa Jal. He's Maliki Yawmiddin. And for that reason, because of those names and those attributes and those actions, you alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. As I said, a second question might come up that a person might ask the question and say, well, does your God need you to worship him? Why does God need our worship? Why, if he's so powerful, why does he not let us do whatever we want? Why, why constrain us and restrain us? He said, he doesn't need our worship. We need to worship him. He doesn't need our worship. Whether the whole world worships him or the whole world disbelieves in him, it doesn't change anything for him. But worshipping Allah is the right thing to do because he deserves it. And it benefits you ultimately because it's what's going to bring you happiness in this world and the next. And what's going to bring you tranquility in the heart is to recognize your creator and to worship your creator based upon what you recognize from his names and his attributes and his actions. And that's, just, that's not a comprehensive answer, but it's just a simple answer you can give. And the nice thing is that it brings the answer back to the Quran. Instead of you trying to express that in your own words and trying to say, well, I worship God because, you know, he's, he's given me so many blessings. And the person turns around and says, well, he hasn't given me any blessings. You know, why is he best you and not me or something? And you find yourself struggling to explain what you believe. You know it, but you can't find the words. So use the words of Allah instead of your own words. And then explain what it means to people. So what is our, who is our Rabb, the Lord? And why is this so significant? Who is our Rahman, our Rahim, Al Malik, Maliki, Yawmiddin? What does that mean for us as Muslims? Al Ahad, Al Samad. Just explaining Surah Al-Fatiha and قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ be enough. Even قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ if you want to try it a different way, why do you worship Allah? قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ This also it can be used to explain the same thing, that he is one, there is no one else that does what he does. He's unique. Nobody does what Allah does. Unique. Nobody can do what Allah does. Nobody can give me what Allah can give me. Nobody can bless me with what Allah can bless me with. Nobody can harm me with what Allah can harm me with. Nobody can punish me the way that Allah can punish me. Allah is Ahad, he's unique in this. And the one who is unique in this, and he has that unique 
nature and those unique names and attributes, that's the one who deserves to be worshipped. Allah is Samad. Allah is As-Samad. The one who all of us need him. We need to worship him. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned we need to worship Allah more than we need air to breathe. We need to worship Allah. Our need for Allah is greater than our need for air. It's greater than our need for food and water. Our need of Allah is the greatest need that we have. But Allah has no need of us. Allah has no need of us. But Allah promises to help the people who try hard to worship Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just an example of how you could also use that as an explanation. The simple small surahs that you already know and you can explain to someone why it is that you worship Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of His names and attributes and His actions. And that means that the more you come to know Allah, the more you will want to worship Him, the more you love Him. The more you know him, the more you will love him, the more you will want to worship him, and the more you will realize the value in worshiping him. And that's why at a very basic level, like I worship Allah because I'm a Muslim and I believe it's right. That's at a very basic level, but the more you know Allah, it becomes more personal than that. I worship Allah because of the love that I have for Allah, because of Allah's names and attributes and actions, and because of the the hope that I have in Allah and because of the fear that I have of Allah. And that's another way of answering the same question again. To say that I worship Allah because of the love that I have for Allah. And the more I know Allah through his names and attributes, the more I come to love him. And because of the hope that I have in what Allah will give me in this life and the next. And because of the fear of what I have, of what Allah will withhold from me or punish me with in this life and the next. And that's how the prophets used to be. And that's why Allah Azawajal said, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ They used to race each other to do good deeds and they used to call upon us in fear and hope and they were humbly submissive to us. Why? They had love, they had hope, they had fear. So that's another way of explaining the same thing and Allah Azza knows best if wudu breaks in the middle of making in the middle of making it should you restart the wudu or continue no you have to restart the wudu from the beginning so if you're in the middle of making wudu let's say for example that you reached the point of washing your face or you reached the point of washing your arms let's say and then you broke your wudu, you have to make wudu again starting at the very beginning. Right? You have to start at the very beginning. As attached to that question, a person might ask the question is, if I missed the end of my wudu and I left the bathroom, for example, or the sink, can I go back and resume or do I have to start again? So the answer to this is whether or not the previous limb has dried. So... For example, if you were, let's say, a person forgot to wash their feet at the end of the wudu. So they wiped over their head and their ears and they got, they got distracted. They forgot about their feet or they had thought that they were going to wipe over their socks. And then they realized that, no, I can't wipe over my socks. I have to take it off to make wudu because it's not the, too much time has passed. So the person... If they're still their face is wet, their arms are wet, their head is wet, their ears are wet, they can go back and just wash their feet. But otherwise a person, if they've become, it's become a while and they've just become dry, then the person needs to go and make wudu again from the beginning and Allah Azza knows best. We'd already answered about zakat al-fitr, that it should be given as, as food. Um, okay, uh, next question. What advice would you give to a person who still feels like their Iman is low despite it being Ramadan? The person feels depressed due to a lack of purpose. They have limited knowledge of the deen. They pray and fast because of the family. And at such a point of despair, to the extent where they feel they have no energy to change and are among the people that are destined to go to Jahannam, billah, to hell. And we ask Allah's refuge from that. A person must never, ever, ever lose hope. 
Because if you lose hope, really, it's kind of thinking badly of Allah. Because it's not the greatness of your sin or the greatness of your mistakes or how far you are away from the religion, but it's the greatness of Allah and the greatness of Allah's forgiveness. And whatever sin you do and whatever mistakes you made and however far you are away from Islam, you are not further away than Allah's forgiveness. You haven't done something greater than Allah's forgiveness. You haven't done something greater than Allah's mercy. You can't. Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than that. You say, why we always hear Muslims saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater than that. Allah is greater than that. Whatever sin you did, Allah is greater than that. Whatever, however far away you went, Allah's mercy is greater than that. But you have to go and seek it. And I think the problem is that you look ahead of you and you think, how do I get all the way over there? But actually you get there with very small baby steps. It starts with a tawbah. Just asking Allah for forgiveness, making a resolve that I really would like to change. I really want to change. And admitting to Allah that I don't really know where to start. I'm not really sure. I'm struggling. And I've got a lot of things that I'm doing wrong. But I ask you to forgive me. That's the first thing. That instantly is going to lighten your heart. If you're sincere about it. It's going to instantly lift you a little bit. Now the question is, are you going to take your next baby step? Might just be remembering Allah. Remembering Allah. Like when the person came to the Prophet and he said, the rules of Islam are so many. and Just give me something comprehensive that I can do. The Prophet said, keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. So maybe it's just start by remembering Allah. Astaghfirullah, when you do something wrong. Saying, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah. And then you see, where does the next step lead you? Where does the next step lead you? And these steps, you might be able to carry them out in a day or a week or a month or a year. Like, But you... You keep taking those steps. And every time you see an opportunity to change in something, okay. So the person says they're praying because of their family. So if you're going to pray, you may as well get rewarded for it. It doesn't make sense to pray and not get rewarded, right? You may as well pray and get rewarded for it. So you may as well make it sincere for Allah and not for your family. Because if you're going to pray anyway, best to pray and get rewarded rather than pray and get nothing because of the intention not being right. The prayer is not going to be perfect. You're not going to pray like the Sahaba did the first time you stand to pray. Rather, maybe all of us, if we gathered our prayer together, wouldn't reach the prayer of one of those companions of the Prophet ﷺ. But you try your best. You try a little bit more, a little bit more. Just sincere. Just keep asking Allah to forgive you, to guide you, to help you. What was the dua in Ramadan that we kept telling everybody to make in the last 10 nights? Allahumma inna ka'afuun. And I, I don't know if many of you have heard this a beautiful video And I'm sure it's, it's been uh, subtitled into English Sheikh Abdul Razak al-Badr Hafizahullah ta'ala And he tells the story of what happened to him one night in Ramadan He said he was going out to the masjid with his father Hafizahullah ta'ala And his grandfather Rahimahullah and they went out and they passed by and it was the 27th night of Ramadan the night when many people think and we don't have proof that it's guaranteed to be Laylatul Qadr on that night but many people think it's Laylatul Qadr and people expect it to be and there were some young kids playing loud music in the car they're not going to pray they're just sitting listening to their music they were disturbing everybody else with the loud music disturbing the people going to the masjid the sheikh he passed by he just knocked on the, the car and he just spoke to them and he said, or he said that he, he spoke to them anyway. And he said to them that, you know, at least if you don't, if you're not going to, you know, join in like that, at, at least, you know, switch the music off. At least don't disturb the other people. Tonight, look, it's the 27th night of Ramadan. It's the last 10 days of Ramadan. And then the Sheikh taught them the dua, Allahumma inna ka'afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anni. Oh Allah, you are the, the one who pardons the most. You love to pardon people, so pardon me. And he taught it. And at first, the boys, they were like boys. You know, they said, 
yeah, yeah, we learnt it, we learnt it, we learnt it. The Sheikh said, Aid, repeat it for me. And he couldn't repeat it. So the Sheikh again repeated it to him slowly. And he said, if you do nothing else tonight, didn't go and pray. If you do nothing else tonight, just make that dua. The boys, they didn't go and pray. They didn't join the people praying. They missed whole of, you know, probably that whole Ramadan. What we know, they didn't pray that, they didn't pray in the masjid. They didn't pray those, uh, the last 10 nights of Ramadan at all. Sheikh said after some time, he went to a, a town to deliver a lecture and he saw a young man very, very like practicing. Oh, he said, I saw upon him all, yani all the signs of good on him. You know, he looked like a good, a good practicing Muslim. And he came to him and said, Sheikh, I was one of the boys in that car that night. Just from a dua. They went from that to that. And now he organized the Sheikh's class, lectures in the city, in the town that he was in. He was the one organizing the Sheikh's lectures. He was one of those young kids messing about in the car that night. Who learned that dua, Allahumma inna ka'afoon tuhibu al-afwa fa'afu anni. Subhanallah. Small duas, ask Allah's forgiveness. Ask Allah's guidance. Ask Allah to help you learn a few small du'as that you can make. Make your salah sincere for Allah because you said you're praying already. You said you're praying already. So if you're praying already, I don't need to say to you about taking baby steps and starting to pray because you're praying already. But make it sincere. Every time you see, what you're going to see is Allah is going to open for you one more step and then you have to choose. Am I going to take it or not? You take it, Allah will open you one more step. You take it, Allah will open you one more step. What's my evidence? Allah gives increase in guidance to those who are guided. And that's my evidence. That every time you take one step further down that road, Allah opens you one more that you can take. But then comes the issue where a lot of people, a lot of people start to get scared of where they're going. And I don't mean about hell. <laughs> if people were scared of hell, that would be a good thing. But people start to get scared about what they might turn into. What's going to happen to my friends? What about my life? What about my, you know, my lifestyle? What I eat and drink and where I go and how I have fun. It's all going to go. Where's go you know, where are these steps going to lead me? What am I going to look like? You know, imagine there's a, like, let's say, for example, there's a, it could be anyone. There's a sister, for example, going through this situation, for example. And she's thinking, am I really going to see myself, you know, all wearing hijab and everything and, you know, covering myself like that? It, it, six months down the line, my friend's not going to talk to me anymore. My life is going to fall apart. Maybe in a relationship, that relationship's going to break up. I'm going to be left with nothing. And the shaitan keeps on telling you. Shaitan promises you poverty and he threatens you with or he, uh, he commands you. He, he, he threatens you with poverty and he commands you, he commands you to do evil. And so a person starts getting scared and so they don't take the next step. Even though they're taking baby steps, nobody's pushing you that hard you're just taking small baby steps I start to pray I start to do this I start. but then there comes tests along the road and you have to be prepared for them if you really want Jannah you really want what's with Allah you have to be willing just to keep on taking those baby steps and don't be scared don't be scared because as anyone will tell you who's taken those steps where you will end up will be so much of a better place than where you are now you'll be so much happier with yourself your life will be so much better your friends will be so much better You'll have so much more fun. Everything will be better. But you have to keep taking those baby steps. Step by step. Bit by bit. Keep on looking. There's another chance for me to do something. Okay, I've never dot 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 before. Okay, bismillah. It's my time to start now. And you'll feel, you'll taste something. You'll taste the sweetness of Iman. And when you taste the sweetness of Iman, Iman is the sweetest thing. And so you will become attracted to it and you'll develop a sweet tooth for Iman, inshallah, and you'll be, you'll be okay. Don't ever despair. If you despair, it's because you don't know Allah. You didn't give Allah His fair, you weren't fair to Allah if you despair. Because you, you considered that Allah 
is not great enough to forgive you or that Allah is not great enough to have mercy on you or Allah is not great enough to guide you and that is a huge, huge sin to think of Allah like that. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَخْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ all my servants who have transgressed against themselves, don't despair of the mercy of Allah. Allah forgives all sins. Make tawbah, repent, take your baby steps. Every time you see a chance to do a good deed, grab it. And all those bad deeds in the past will all be wiped out. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, اتق الله حيث ما كنت واتبع السيئة الحسنة تمحها وخالق الناس بخلق حسن أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم that he said have taqwa of Allah wherever you are and follow up a good deed, a bad deed with a good deed and it will wipe it out and treat the people with the best of manners. What's the ruling of photography and videography? Well, this is a big question. It's a big question and it's not an easy question. And it's not a question in which my teachers agree, let alone, you know, like our mashayikh, our scholars, uh, don't all agree. Uh, I personally am quite comfortable with video, digital video. I feel that digital video is not like a, uh, it's not like a picture that remains still like that. And the fact that it's digital, it doesn't have any permanence. It only exists for the time that you watch it. And then when you close, it has no permanence. Like a mirror, the image exists during the time that you walk in front of it. And when you walk away, there, there's nothing left. And that's in digital photography, the image is stored as zeros and ones, bits and bytes, right? So it has no permanence to it. And the fact that it's video, it's moving, it's not the same. Well, I feel okay, you know, with digital video. If a person wishes to avoid it, well, I have the utmost respect for them. There are some people who still continue to avoid all forms of uh, videography, photography. They don't do any of it. And I, I have the utmost respect for that. Uh, me personally, I have come to the conclusion that I'm okay with digital video, hence why I record my videos and I upload them. Uh, digital photography, if it must be done, but I mean, I, I, I personally find myself away from that now because I, I just don't see that there's so rarely a need for it. And the closer you get towards printed photography or drawing pictures or making stuff that, you know, you're just, it's darakat, it's levels going down. So me personally, um, I, I don't really do the digital photography anymore. Maybe in the past, not too much anyway. Because I just, I just see that, I don't see there's a need for it now. You know, for me, I'm comfortable with digital video. The odd time when you need the digital photography, if, if it must be, if, it's, if it really has to be used for something, like it's really needed for something. Um, but generally speaking, you know, try to the best of possible to avoid whatever you can. And all of it is taswir. All of it is, all of it is making images. But the question is, does it fall under the prohibition or not? It's a big topic with lots of different aspects to it. Why are images prohibited? What is the illa, the reason behind it? Uh, is it because of the fear that they'll be venerated and worshipped besides Allah? Is it because of competing with the creation of Allah? Or is it both? Where, and what are the limits and so on? So there's a lot to talk about in that. But I would just give you a short summary. That at the moment, I'm comfortable with digital video. The video is never, um, it never exists outside of the digital format. Um, nothing is printed out from it and it's moving video and I kind of feel that that is something that we can do on a personal level but like I said I have the utmost respect for the people who don't even do that and Allah is the general's best a sister currently doing hifth of the Quran um, 
The sister was in pain and she opened the Mus'haf to do some recitation and found a verse talking exactly about the situation and the solution and became in awe of the Qur'an and Allah's mercy. Now it's become my habit to make dua for guidance and open the Mus'haf at random to find the solution for what I'm facing. It, I fear if I'm doing something which might be an innovation or is it a blessing from Allah and I should venerate it. I think it's a very intelligent question and very uh, thoughtful of you to think about it like that. Uh, I, I do believe that opening the Mus'haf for a solution on a regular basis like that is a bid'ah, or close to being a bid'ah. We fear for it being an innovation. And that's because we don't see the Sahaba doing that, or the Prophet ﷺ doing it, or the generations who came after them, that they said, if you ever feel stuck, just open the Mus'haf. But if it happens to you, there is no harm in it. So what, I, what happened to you in the beginning was a blessing from Allah. Is you opened the Mus'haf not as an act of worship deliberately that, okay, what's going to happen? It wasn't that. It wasn't that. You opened it to recite the Qur'an and Allah blessed you with a karama that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a, a little miracle not like the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ, but the karamat, the, the, the small miracles that Allah gives to people, that Allah gave you the solution for what you were looking for. And anytime you feel uncertain, you can open the Qur'an. But it's not a case of you like, open the Qur'an, that's going to be my solution. But more a case of, let me open the Qur'an, let me recite, perhaps Allah will open my heart to something as a solution in there. There is no issue with that. The Prophet ﷺ, when he became troubled by something, he would turn to the prayer. When something would trouble him and he got, he got stressed and worried about it, and it started to, to worry him, he would pray. And within the prayer, he would find his guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is no, no harm in you opening the Mus'haf and saying, you know, I just feel so stressed about this, or I'm worried about it. Open the Mus'haf and just recite. But it's not open the Mus'haf and the answer will be under my finger. But just open the Mus'haf and recite, perhaps Allah will lighten my heart with the recitation and Allah will bring me the answer to what I'm looking for and inspire the answer for me. There's no harm. But as for opening the Mus'haf to find the answer like that, then I fear that this might come under the ruling of an innovation and Allah knows best. Okay, this is a very important question and uh, I hope I can do this answer justice, to be honest. So uh, the question asked, what can be done about the rampant anti-black racism plaguing the Muslim Ummah, especially and sadly by Arabs? It's curious that very few scholars speak about the situation. I know the Prophet Wasallam's last sermon condemned racism and in the Quran it says taqwa is the most important characteristic of the person. Are there ahadith that look down upon black people? Please answer for Jazakallah khairan. May Allah Azza reward you with good as well. Wallah, this is a very important question and it's very relevant in our time and in reality it needs an answer which is thoroughly prepared and, and given its right because it's a major issue facing people in the world today in all different religions and cultures and it is something which is, we would be wrong to say that it's not facing the Muslims as well. It's facing the Muslims in terms of them being recipients of that, like re being suffering that, that racism. Uh, and it's also a problem that we have within Islam, and I will explain why. It's certainly nothing to do with the Hadith, and nothing to do with the Qur'an. The Qur'an and the Hadith have... And we're going to speak about that. You know, nothing but, but every, you will not find anything within them except good. However, it's to do with something that Allah told us about in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal said, Inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal-ardi wal-jibal. 
فأبين أن يحملنها وأشفقنا منها وحملها الإنسان إنه كان ظلوما جهولا Allah said we offered the responsibility of following the laws and the rules of Islam to the heavens and the earth and the mountains and they refused and declined it and they were fearful of it and mankind took it on indeed he was extremely oppressive and extremely ignorant this ayah at the end of Surah Al-Ahzab it tells us that there are certain characteristics that exist within people that are fundamentally ignorant and oppressive characteristics unless a person is guided away from those characteristics and is guided to something better and so racism in all of its different forms and its different wherever it crops up and to in whichever way it crops up is part of that dhulm and jahl the oppression and the ignorance that exists within people all of all human beings unless they correct their character and they unless they uh, bring themselves to a higher standard than that that that's that sort of situation that they find themselves in and that's why you see it across the world you see it in many many different countries i don't think it's fair to highlight necessarily arabs as such i think that that in itself is probably it might be it might be somewhat uh, what's the word it might be an example of of kind of two wrongs don't make a right yeah like but to say that yeah it is true among is it true that racism exists among arab communities yes is it true that racism exists among muslim communities yes is it true that racism exists among almost almost every community has forms of this because this is from al jahiliya is from the ways of the time before islam came and gave us izza islam came and gave us honor islam came and told us that what matters to allah azza wa jal is your heart and not how you look and allah la yanduru ila suwarikum allah doesn't look doesn't doesn't look at how you look Allah doesn't care what color skin you have. Allah doesn't look about how you look or how beautiful or whatever. Allah doesn't look at how you look. Allah looks at your heart. And the Prophet ﷺ told us there's no virtue for a white man or as the Arabs say, Ahmar, the red man, over a black man or a black man over a white man, except by a taqwa. By how close you are to God, that's what matters. That's what Islam came with. But this jahiliyyah, the people don't leave it. This ignorance that from that came from the time that came from before Islam, that came from the ignorance that people live in if they don't have Islam to correct them, and they don't have Islam to bring them. And no, and I honestly believe, Allah, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, "Wala qad karamna bani Adam." We have certainly honored the children of Adam. Allah didn't say we have certainly honored the white man, and Allah didn't say. Any 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 specific race or any specific color or any specific ethnicity, Allah said, "Wa laqad karamna bani Adam." We have certainly honored Bani Adam. So every single one of Bani Adam has a right to be honored, has a right to be their status to be, and their, you know, their, what's the word, the sanctity of themselves, their life, their blood, their honor, their wealth. That that sanctity cannot be taken from a person from the children of Adam. Certainly not because of the color of their skin. Allahumma, unless we're talking about a judicial punishment which is carried out against a criminal, that's a different matter. But the children of Adam have been honored by Allah. And this brings us back to where did we all come from? Kullukum min Adam. Wa Adam min turab. All of you came from Adam, and Adam came from the dirt. And that's why you have different colors among uh, Bani Adam, among the children of Adam. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. That when Allah ﷺ created Adam, He created Adam from the Turab, from the earth, the dust of the earth. Look at the dust of the earth. What do you see in it? Do you not see some of the sand on the earth is white as white can be? And isn't, do you have the Harra, the volcanic rock of the earth, which is dark black? And you have earth which is brown 
and you have earth which is light, sandy colored, and you have all the spectrum of colors in between. And because Allah Azza wa created Adam from the earth, so the children of Adam came out with many different colors and many different looks and different to skin tones that the children of Adam came with. All of you came from Adam. The name Adam itself, the name Adam, the actual word Adam in Arabic actually means dark skinned. The word Adam. I never quite found out whether it means extremely dark, what exact skin tone it means. I mean, some of them said that Adam, it means Eswat, it means black. Uh, and some of them said Adam, it means very dark brown. But in any case, the word Adam, it means dark skinned. The word Adam, the name. Some of the, I, I, I read some people said that that was the color of the, the skin of our father Adam. Uh, السلام, but that requires further research, why he was given that name Adam. But the name itself means dark skinned. Ultimately, all of us came from Adam, whatever skin color we have. All of you are from Adam, and that's why I remember a very interesting, it's kind of a light-hearted, it's not a light-hearted topic, but it's a light-hearted story. I remember being with a, a group of brothers. We were all different from different, uh, what's the word, different uh, backgrounds, different uh, skin tones, or what have you. And uh, one of them, you know, we, we all from the UK so we came into this particular place and the passport person you know like he wants to ask where's everybody from so of course when I tell him I'm British he accepts it from me of course you're British go <laughs> like as if what is it what does that mean yeah, yeah go, no problem British Asli really like 100% genuine article okay go but one of the brothers he gave him a hard time he gave him a hard time you know like where are you from? No, no, don't tell me you're British. Where are your parents from? And the end, very, very beautiful answer the brother gave. He said, I'm from Turab. I'm from the dirt. I'm from Adam. Ultimately, I'm from the same place you're from. So uh, this whole idea of looking down on people because of their skin color or because of their ethnicity or because of their tribe, all of this is from Amrul Jahiliya, from the matters of pre-Islamic ignorance and if you see what people were like in pre-Islamic times wallah, you, you can't imagine right, the level of oppression and the level of ignorance that was there before Allah raised us with Islam so ultimately we as Muslims should be at the forefront of displaying to the rest of the world how to behave because the rest of the world sadly remains upon its jahiliyyah it hasn't gone out of this jahili. It hasn't gone out and of this ignorance and oppression because it hasn't been guided out of it. And the Muslims, we have a duty to show to other people what it really means or what it really means to have and to see people on the scale of taqwa, not on the scale of how they look. To judge people on, in terms of their, their commitment to the religion and not to care about what color skin the person has or where the person comes from or their background and so on and that we show people the sanctity of the lives of Bani Adam and how important it is to preserve the life of every single individual from Bani Adam as we said except or unless we're talking about the issue of punishments and so on and, and you know that's a separate topic but generally we certainly honored the children of Adam. And as for the Prophet, ﷺ, then he set the best example of this. So you see, the Sahaba, they didn't see between themselves those things. And whenever those things cropped up, and sometimes things cropped up, because remember, this is a human, what's the word, a human flaw, something like a, a disease of the heart, which is from the matters of jahiliya that people don't leave, people keep coming back to it. And they keep coming back to it and they keep falling into it. Whenever things like this would happen, be it racism or tribalism or whatever, the Prophet would stamp it out. And he would ensure that the people understood ikhwa. The believers are nothing but brothers. The believers are nothing but brothers. And that's why you see examples that how the Sahaba used to be. 
that they saw every Muslim to be like their blood brother or their blood sister. And you have amazing examples of that. And they didn't see that it was based on colour or ethnicity or previous nationality or ethnic background or anything like that. They saw each other as being brothers. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Islam gave the best example of getting people away from racism and stamping it out and bringing people out of all of these evil traits that are part of jahili, a part of ignorant times. And ultimately, if we've lost that as Muslims, that's because we've lost the original Islam that the Prophet used to practice. So now I've seen, wallah, and, and I, I feel so, I was, I was with a, a friend of mine. Um, we were just chatting about things quite a while back. And I was saying that, you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, in the country I was in at that time, I said, Alhamdulillah, you know, like people are really nice here. And he kind of looked at me and said, like, are they? I said, maybe to you they are. Like, but you, you know, you need, like, and it's a reminder. Like, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but like, he insinuated or he suggested that, you know, it's not the same for everybody. That sadly speaking, uh, people from a certain ethnic background, certain nationality sometimes, certain color of skin are treated differently in the Muslim world to others. And that's because those people who are treating them differently have left the Islam that the Prophet ﷺ taught, not as in left Islam, but they've, they've let it go. They've let it go. They've, they've passed it aside. And instead, they've gone back to al-jahiliyyah, back to how things were before Islam came. And there are, you know, subhanAllah, amazing things to reflect upon. This answer needs a proper, detailed, detailed answer. As for the last part of the question, a hadith that looked down upon black people. There are no a hadith to that I can recall that anyone could understand that from. However, if a person has heard a hadith and maybe misunderstood it, for example, then it's important to mention the hadith so it can be clarified what the meaning of the hadith is. I can think of, in fact, the opposite. I remember the hadith just from the top of my head. And maybe this is an appropriate hadith to quote. The hadith of the lady she used to clean the masjid of the Messenger of Allah. She was a black lady. She used to clean the masjid of the Prophet. And many of the people didn't really think anything of her. Like they, they didn't see her as being someone really important. Well, she was just a lady who cleaned the masjid. She'd come herself and make her time and sweep the masjid and clean the you know, the things out of the masjid. The masjid was sand. The base of the masjid was sand. And so she used to come and clean the masjid. And one day she didn't come to clean the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ said, where is the, the lady that she used to come and clean, clean the masjid? Where's this woman? Sahaba said she died. We, you know, we, we shrouded her. We, we, we buried her. We prayed over her. And they didn't inform the Prophet ﷺ about it. They didn't tell him. Because they thought that it was just a, it's just a, Insignificant, it's just, you know, just someone who comes and cleans the masjid, it's nothing important, you know. Like when people would die, and not everybody, the Prophet can't be around for all of his companions. The Prophet became upset when he heard this and he told them to show where her grave was. And he stood by her grave and he prayed over her. And that's just an example of how the Prophet he didn't see that this woman was any less because she was a black woman or because she was a cleaner, she wasn't a you know, uh. Uh, let's say, you know, a, a, a noble woman or someone who had like, you know, a lot of status in the society or a person. She was just a cleaner. But the Prophet ﷺ took care of every single one of his companions. There are many, many examples of among the black companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Many that we know and some maybe that we don't know. And if someone were to gather these together and to bring together their life stories and to share it with people, people would, inshallah ta'ala, benefit a great deal from that. There's a lot of things that need to be done. But we as Muslims need to challenge this. And this is the last point that I'll make on this topic. We need to challenge racism within ourselves before even we look to challenge it on a wider level. In terms of the wider level, the wider society, yes, I mean, I think that as Muslims, we are concerned with al-maslahat wal amma the things which are generally in the interest of everybody. And from in the general interest of everybody is for people to be treated fairly regardless of color. That is something that is in terms of the police and so on. That is something that is in the maslaha of everyone. 
It's in the interest of every single person living in those countries, in the West or wherever, and everywhere else, that people are treated fairly. Because everyone wants that, would want that for themselves. You want to be treated fairly and justly, not to be treated differently based on the color of your skin. That's, the, that's one aspect. But at the same time, also the Muslims need to be careful. Not everything that the non-Muslims do is it appropriate for a Muslim to follow. No doubt, we as Muslims have to find our own contribution to this. That's what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying, I'm not trying to sort of detract from anything, but I'm trying to say that we have to find our contribution that's appropriate to us as Muslims. We should be lil muttaqina imama, examples for the pious. And that means we have to challenge it in our families. We have to challenge it when our, in, in our children. We have to correct these mistakes when we see them. And we have to be aware of what's happening. And sometimes it hurts you when you're not aware, subhanAllah. Like when, a, you know, your close friend says to you, like, bro, you don't, like, if you were me, you will see how people treat you differently. And it's, it's sad, wallah, and it hurts to think that you're not aware of those things. So we have to be aware of them. We have to raise awareness among Muslims. But we've got to do this in the way that Islam tells us. We're not going to go behind everything that the non-Muslims do and copy it. The Prophet said, وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Whoever resembles a people is one of them. And that, that's something that I worry about sometimes. With There, there might be a just cause, a, 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 a good cause. But sometimes not everything that is done under the name of that cause might be Islamically right. What matters is Islam. It doesn't matter what I think or what someone else thinks. Islamically is this such thing allowed. So we must be careful to do things in the way that Islam allows it. And in terms of ourselves, raising awareness. Raising awareness, you know, in all of the different spheres and different areas and challenging these things when they happen and educating people and educating our families, educating our communities. And I don't think it helps to kind of, as much as, I, and I might be, I don't know whether people might, inshallah people understand what I'm saying. That I don't think it helps to say that the Arabs do this and the Arabs do that and the Arabs are... I think that's part of the same problem, to be honest with you. It might not be on the same level, no doubt the, the mistreatment of uh, certain groups within the Muslim Ummah is worse than others, no doubt. But it also doesn't help to take a big brush and paint everybody with it. Because among the Arab community, I've met people, wallah, from among the best of the people. And the most, yeah, people who, wallah, if we could achieve I need, if we could achieve even if 1% of what they achieved, wallah, like it would be amazing. And people who I have seen with my own eyes and people who maybe you don't know, you're thinking about mashayikh and so on, but people who I personally know, uh, who, wallah, I, I saw from them the best of akhlaq and the best of manners towards all the people. And there's a particular brother, and I'm not going to mention his name, but it's a very, you know, from a Saudi family, a very uh, honorable brother from a Saudi family with a good uh, family name and a good reputation. And well, I, I saw the way that he dealt with the migrant workers, you know, people who were um, sometimes African migrant workers or uh, Bangladeshi migrant workers, Indian migrant workers, people who really get suffer in that society. And well, he would stop the car and you would think that that, worker was the teacher and that he was the student like the way that he would talk to them the honor the, the good manners that you would see that you see people like that and it, it reminds you that not everybody is the same there is a problem we're not going to say there's not a problem we should call a spade a spade there's a problem everywhere it's a it's a human problem because it's a problem from the time of jahiliyyah and we need to get and the Problem is that the Muslim world has slowly slipped back into all of the aspects of jahiliyyah, in everything. The prayer, you know, the way we practice Islam, the way we treat women, everything has slipped back into the time of jahiliyyah. Everything has gone backwards. But there remain people in every community, in every community, who continue to uphold that Islam as, as the Prophet ﷺ did. And what we just need people to do is just educate people about Islam. Because when you see real Islam, when you see real Islam, subhanAllah, you will really, it will open your eyes. It will open your eyes. When you see real Islam, it should open your eyes. 
and I think there are evidences of people who went through that experience, Malcolm X comes to mind, and others who when they saw what Islam really represents, they understood that Islam is the solution. But we have to educate and we have to correct this issue within our Muslim community. And of course, if there are ayat or ahadith that people want to understand properly, Allah doesn't oppress anybody, so you don't have to worry about that. But you do sometimes have to look at a hadith and ask, okay, what's the meaning of this hadith? What's the context of this hadith? And so on. And inshallah ta'ala, the people of knowledge can explain those to you. It's not a, you know, a comprehensive reply to the issue. It needs a lecture as much as it needs anything else. But just a few words that I wanted to say, and Allah Azza wa knows best. And just another five minutes, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, trying to get through the, as many questions as possible. So my sister works as a financial manager. Money is arranged only after her approval. Things that come under the marketing department, such as payments for TV ads, printing of advertising posters, events held at shop outlets, etc. Video clips with music, posters with women showing the aura, events containing music. The financial manager signs papers to approve money for these things. I want to broaden this question a little bit wider and talk about a very simple principle. This principle will help you to answer many of these related questions. And that is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَىٰ وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Cooperate in goodness and righteousness. Or righteousness and fearing Allah. Or doing good and keeping away from sins. And cooperate with each other in doing good and keeping away from sins. And don't cooperate with each other in sin and transgression. Any responsibility or any job in which you are required to cooperate and facilitate sin and transgression is not permissible. That's a principle like that. There's a difference between, there are some nuances, some little differences. For example, uh, there are times when you don't know what a person's gonna do with it. Like for example, I'm, a, I'm, I'm in a shop and I'm selling items. And someone comes to buy a knife. It's not my responsibility whether they're going to use that knife to stab someone or they're going to use that knife to chop up onions. Regular person came, there's no obvious sign of anything wrong with them and they came to buy a knife. It's their problem. I have to, you know, it's not for me to know the, 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 what's behind a person's intention. But when it's clear that a person is not going to use that for good, that's one thing. Uh, you see that you see qara and you see evidences or indicators of that. That's one thing. And uh, the second thing is the, that when you are actively facilitating something wrong to happen, you know when you sign those papers, when a, when a sister signs those papers that says that the money can be, can be spent on this, the only way they can achieve their goal is with her signature. The only way. And so it's a kind of cooperation upon sin and transgression. We ask Allah Azza wa to make it easy for her to find something better than that. Because there, 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 there will be something better, inshallah ta'ala. No one ever leaves something for Allah except that Allah will give them better in its place. I think we'll take the last question in this one. A person was asking for uh, a talk in Urdu about Rizq and adding the link in the YouTube question link. Well, I, um, I don't know if they ever put it on, I don't know if they ever put it on YouTube, that's the thing. I'll look into it, inshallah. So that was a question I need to look into. I need to come back to you on that one, inshallah. So, a uh, final question we'll deal with here is very, very good question. Regarding the statement of Ibn Qudama, uh, وَإِنْ أَسْلَمَ الرَّجُلْ فَخَافَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ مِنَ الْخِتَانِ سَقَطَ عَنْ That if a person becomes Muslim and fears for themselves the, 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 the danger of circumcision, then it's not required from them. He said, لِأَنَّ الْغُسْلَ وَالْوُضُوءُ وَغَيْرَهُمَا يَسْقُطُ إِذَا خَافَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ مِنْهُ 
because ghusl and wudu and others are not an obligation if you fear for yourself in them. So this is very, very easy to understand. Ibn Qudama makes a completely valid analogy between circumcision and between the issue around ghusl. Both are done for cleanliness. Both are done as an obligation uh, in Islam. So what happens if you have a wound and you fear that if I make ghusl, I'm going to die or I'm going to become severely ill by making ghusl? We have a text in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that the person doesn't make ghusl. The person isn't required to make ghusl. They make tayammum instead because they, if they were to take a bath with that wound, there is a danger that they would die or they would become severely, severely ill. That is the one who ghusl is prohibited or ghusl, they are, they are excused from ghusl. So the same situation applies to circumcision. Someone who has... Uh, some sort of infection or they don't find a clean uh, place where they can do the procedure someone who will do the procedure cleanly for them and they fear that they would get an infection that might cause them severe harm severe injury or uh, great uh, you know problems would or complications because of that that is what that is what would prevent a person from circumcision as for pain generally then no Pain is not, isn't, isn't included, nor is sort of, um, what's the word, like a fear of discomfort or just having some issues. But generally, if, if the person goes to a reliable uh, doctor or reliable uh, practitioner of circumcision and was to say to them, is it safe for me? And the person says, yeah, it's safe. It will be uncomfortable a little bit. You have to take painkillers for a couple of days and it might be uncomfortable when you go to the bathroom for a little while, but it's not dangerous for you. If it's not dangerous for you, then the obligation remains. It's not a matter of like discomfort or pain, but it's more a matter of uh, whether it's dangerous for the person in terms of either death or in terms of severe illness from it. And it could be people. There could be all kinds of conditions a person might have, infections a person might have, temporary, permanent conditions that the doctor says it's not safe for you to have this procedure. And if it's not safe for you to have the procedure, then you wait until it is safe. Or like a person has a temporary illness, this is not safe right now, but you know when you get over your illness, it should be fine. Or a person has a permanent condition and the doctor says it's not safe for you to have this procedure. I don't believe it's safe. Then the person should not have that procedure. Just like the ghusl, if it's dangerous for you to make ghusl, you don't make ghusl. So inshallah that would explain the statement of Ibn Qudama, rahimahullah ta'ala. So just to remind everyone a couple of points before we take the last couple of answers from the, uh, from the uh, live stream. So just a couple of points inshallah. First one is I have closed the questions now. I've closed the Google form. Uh, please don't all disappear inshallah uh, for next week. But... The reason why is I have over a hundred questions which I haven't answered. Maybe 150. There's a hundred on the screen, but there might be 50 or so that I skipped. In order for me to answer those questions um, well, I need to just, just, inshallah, what we'll do is we will try to use the next few weeks because we don't know how long until the masjid will open, two, three weeks, maybe Allah knows best. And... So inshallah, we'll use that time to go through these questions and I will try to summarize them. I'm going to print them and try or I'm going to try on the computer to just bring them all together instead of dealing with them individually and just try to have like as much of them answer, as many of them answered as possible before the end of the class, before we stop these Q&A sessions that are being done over live stream. If we continue them, we may continue them. Allah knows best. We might continue them in the masjid. I don't know whether that's something we will do or not. Allah knows best, but at least for this time that we've been at home this time during COVID-19 where we've been uh, restrictions where we've been at home we want to try to finish the questions that people ask so I've, I've disabled new questions until we finish the old ones inshallah and Allah knows best wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammad wa ali wa sahbihi ajma'in Abdurrahman sorry quickly before we finish did you have anything urgent on the I know people ask very good questions. I can't answer all of the ones on the side, but just if you see something that might be someone misunderstood something I said or had an important point to make about something I said. 
Halim is perfectly fine. No, no problem with Halim, inshallah. A person can be Halim. And Abdul Halim is the servant of the most Halim. And Hilm is to forgive or to not to, not to be quick to take retribution. That's what Al Hilm is. So when someone does something wrong to you, you're not like quick to get your own back, to take revenge. You're, you're patient and you let a lot of things go. And Allah is Al-Halim, the one who is the, has the most hilm. Because we disobey Allah and we, we do terrible things. And still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives and pardons us. And we should be halim towards other people as well. Right? So there's nothing wrong with being called halim, inshallah. Yeah, with Al, it's better they take the Al off. Al Hakim. It's better they take the Al off. And they can keep uh, Hakim, inshallah. Uh, th there's nothing wrong with Hakim. But they can take the Al off so that they don't get called Mr. Al Hakim or something like that. And can't let them call themselves Hakim. Hakim is fine, inshallah. Was that all the, from the ones that we had to answer? Okay. That's what Allah made easy for us to mention. We'll be back next week, inshallah, finishing off questions. We, are, we can't take any more new ones, except there's always the, you know, the live chat. People can post a question and we can see what we can do. And that's what Allah made easy for me to mention. Whatever I said that was correct, that was a gift from Allah, from His grace and His mercy. Whatever I said was incorrect, was just a mistake from myself. And Allah and His Messenger have nothing to do with that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah knows best. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.